Hola, mis hermanos, hermanas. How are you this morning? First of all, I wanted to begin this morning's, uh, this morning's observance by thanking you all for understanding my absence yesterday. Um, I was where I needed to be. I was back home with my babies celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month during our homecoming game, a game that we won, by the way. So thank you so much for understanding. I don't know about you, but I'm very excited about today's observance, and I'm going to tell you why. You see, these observances have always been of extraordinary significance to our, associ our association's ethnically diverse communities because they do two things. One, they highlight the work of some amazing leaders along with their strategic partnerships with our association. And two, we highlight the work that needs to be done to continue to protect our students and our communities. Today, I would like to begin by highlighting a third. You, our students' greatest asset. Leaders elected to stand guard back home in your state delegations. Leaders who make sure all students are provided access to a great public education in their schools and in their communities. Leaders whose organizational focus remains steadfast, who continue to push the discussion around race and equity and push forward even when those around us are feeling a little fragile or uncomfortable. I apologize. With that in mind, I would like to begin by acknowledging some of the heroes in this space and the work they have led on in the area of Latino and immigrant rights. I ask that as I call out your state delegations, you stand and be recognized and remain standing until all have been acknowledged. Would the California Teachers Association please stand? <laughs> California is a leader in our work around racial and social justice. We have heard our sister Cecily talk time and time again about UTLA's commitment to Black Lives Matter, but that is not all UTLA has done. They've created new and innovative ways of empowering students via their dream centers. Safe havens for dreamers who need safe spaces to talk about their educational pathway and support in navigating the immigration process. Thank you, CTA and UTLA, for everything you do. <laughs> Would the Texas State Teachers Association be, please stand and be recognized? <laughs> Education Austin has been an organizational leader in our fight for immigration rights. Montserrat Garibay, the former vice president of um, Education Austin, was one of our mentors and leaders in this work. Her work helped lay the foundation for current NEA policies and practices around DACA, DAPA, citizenship drives, know your rights, and countless other initiatives. We acknowledge and value the importance of this work and would, would not be where we are today without the mentorship provided by TSTA. Thank you so much. <laughs> would the Illinois Education Association please stand and be recognized. My state association has been leading the charge in the area of racial and social justice as well. Our association members have worked tirelessly to put together DACA clinics with the mentorship of Montserrat Garibay from Education Austin um, in both Arabic and English and Spanish. Um, we understand that this work would not be possible without the partnership and relationships we have built with outside organizations such as MALDEF um, and the Arab American Family Services. We understand that our work is necessary to advance and protect our students' rights within the American educational system, and that this work requires all of us to lean in and show up for one another, be present to advance our students' access and provide them great access to uh, pu a public education. Thank you for everything you do, IEA. <laughs> you see, everything we do is to protect our students their learning conditions, their access to educational opportunities, and their future. Our collective goal is, and always has been, empowering them with a life full of opportunity, opportunities sought in many of our nation's Hispanic-serving institutions. As many of you know, one of our strategic goals is to engage the next generation of educators and recruit educators more representative of the communities that we serve, communities of color. We invited today's special guests with that in mind. 
I ask that you reflect on the work and the information shared here today and think about what you can do to help lead on this work, what you can do to bring this information back to your state and local associations, and what you can do to help empower the next generation of ethnically diverse leaders. Haku is one of the many strategic partners helping us take the lead in the area of student recruitment into our profession. Today, I am happy to have with us Luis Maldonado, the Vice President of Haku. Now, I would like to yield to my president, Lily Eskelson Garcia, to introduce our guest, Luis Maldonado, the president of the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. Thank you. There's not a lot that I have to, to add. Um, Luis is um, the chief advocacy officer. Uh, this, these are the GR folks. Remember, you went up on the hill and you knocked on doors and you expected congressmen and senators to listen to you. He does that every day. He does that as his day job, and he's done that for many, many years. Um, in this case, what uh, brings him to us is the partnership that we have and the work that we do with making sure that every one of our students in the K-12 world can aspire to a college or university education. And once you get into that college, uh, or university, the dropout rate for our children who might be um, immigrants, who might be uh, second English language learners, uh, who might not have the wherewithal to pay, and that is across all uh, uh, racial uh, lines today. Um, how do we help those kids make their, those kids, those young people make their dreams come true? This is a true partner a true hero in um, the Hispanic serving institutions in our country, but also for our Latino students. Please welcome Luis Maldonado. Thank you very much. Good morning, buenos dias. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you this morning. Uh, I want to thank uh, Lily. I want to thank Gladys. I want to thank Merwin. And I want to thank um, <laughs> Melody, I'm sorry, uh, for the kind and generous invitation to be here with you. Um, as you heard, I'm with the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, and I wanted to take the opportunity this morning to share with you a very important piece of the work that we do at HACU, which is actually new work for HACU. And we want to partner with the NEA and all its members in making sure that this gets accomplished because the benefits and the results of this would be monumental, not only for our children, our schools, but our country. So with that, let me begin. For those of you who might not be familiar with HACU, we were created in 1986 by 18 member uh, colleges and universities. We're headquartered in San Antonio. We also have offices in, uh, here in DC, which is the one I manage, and we have one in Sacramento, California, where we do policy work at the state level out west. We have now over 470 members from the original 18. Uh, throughout the United States, uh, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Spain. Uh, we do a lot of international work. And right now, our collective members educate or enroll 5 million students. That's over 25% of the entire student body in higher education in this country at the moment. There is a long history of collaboration between HACU and NEA uh, through our annual conferences, which change from city to city. We will be in Atlanta, Georgia uh, next week. Um, you might know, Georgia is now the 10th largest Hispanic state in the country. And this is the first time that we are in the city of Atlanta to acknowledge the growth not only in Georgia, but around Georgia. And we'll see more data around that. Uh, we're gonna be in Chicago, Illinois next year, um, San Diego the year after that, et cetera. So we wanna partner, continue to partner with the NEA uh, you have been uh, part of our Capital Forum, which is our fly-in policy conference. Um, and 
some staff of the NEA is actually very involved right now in something we call the Act on the Dream Summit, where we're co collaborating with other sister organizations and institutions in DC that represent many other institutions across the country to make sure that we finally enact the Dream Act and a clean Dream Act at that. HSIs, Hispanic Serving Institutions, are defined basically by three different points. One of them is the institution has to be 25% or more Hispanic enrollment. And that is full-time equivalent enrollment because such a large proportion of Hispanic students go to college part-time that we want to account for them. So it's, it is not necessarily a head count. It's a full-time equivalent. 50% of the entire student body in that institution has to be low income, not, not the Hispanics, 50% of all students. And that's usually determined by eligibility for federal student aid, Pell Grant, loans, et cetera. And the institution itself has to be low income on a per student basis expenditure wise compared to sister institutions. Those are the three different hoops that HSIs have to fall through. Um, to actually get earn the designation of being an HSI. These are, the result of this at the moment is that there's 492 institutions across the country right now that meet the definition, the enrollment definition. The threshold, the legal threshold is 25%, but the average Hispanic enrollment across those 492 institutions is in fact 46%. So almost half of the entire student body of those institutions are Hispanic, which indicates, math-wise, that there are many institutions at 50, 60, 70, 80 percent enrollment. A very little known fact about HSIs is how diverse they are. Not only do we enroll 46 percent of all Hispanics in higher ed, we enroll more African Americans than all HBCUs combined. We enroll more Asian and Pacific Islanders than all Anapeces combined. We enroll more Native American students than all tribal colleges and universities combined. We are the most diverse set of institutions in the country. The, st the stats on the wall that you see right now are daunting. It really is a challenge because many of these students share one thing they're low income, and they're first generation. And these are the institutions that they're finding access to that dream of higher education. The students form the institution. When they enroll in that institution and they check the box, I'm Hispanic, or I'm African American, or uh, Caucasian. But as it relates to the data, when they check the box for Hispanic, that data gets reported to the Department of Education, the Department of Education two years later publishes the data. So when I say 492, I'm talking about the 2016-2017 enrollment year. So we don't know the number today. We, we can speculate based on the averages year to year, but we actually don't know the number. So next year's data in 2019 will be the 17-18 enrollment year. But you can see the large proportion of diverse students in our HSIs. And key to this conversation is they enroll 68% of all minority students in higher education. HSIs are rapidly growing. They, in the last um, 10 years, they in fact have more than doubled in the number. You can see the growth year to year. I wanted to put this slide on just to give you a, a, an idea of the funding that's available for HSIs and exclusively for HSIs. It's a drop in the bucket considering the need that these institutions have and the type of the population that they're serving. But we're making progress little by little. Uh, over the 20 plus years that HSIs have existed, the amount of money now dedicated to HSIs has been about $3 billion. Uh, but that is still a drop in the bucket. For the, not only for the need today, but the need in the future, which is what I will be quickly getting to. This GIF gives you an idea of the relationship of the growth of HSIs, the blue bars. Federal funding are the green bars. As you can see, those are headed in opposite directions. And the yellow line is Hispanic enrollment in higher education. 
to, that continues to grow. We are, Hispanics are, the only growing component of higher education. Asian and Pacific Islanders are growing at a much smaller rate. We are the only ones growing in significant numbers. As I said, there's 492 institutions in 21 states, and we enroll 65% of all Hispanics in higher education. There's 3.5 million Hispanics in higher ed today. 65% of them are finding their way into an HSI or forming HSIs. So we say HSIs are a 21 state problem or issue or priority. So Haku then invented a term, emerging HSI, because we want to know where the next set of HSIs are coming from. So once their enrollment hits 15%, we track them up to 24.9, because when they hit 25, they're eligible to become an HSI. There's 333 of those. So all of a sudden, that becomes a 36 state priority. You can see the huge jump. It actually gets even more interesting. That's what HSIs look like across the country in the 21 states. This is what emerging HSIs look like. These are the 36 states. Notice Hawaii is on the map. This is what both of them look like. So now we know, we have a clear indication of where, where the next set of Hispanics are accessing higher education and where they're concentrating. But the story gets even better. Haku recently announced we have a new initiative. You might have noticed in the funding slide that the undergraduate program is part A. The graduate program is part B. Well, we're trying to get creative with Title V of the Higher Education Act by proposing a new grant program where Hispanic serving institutions can collaborate with Hispanic serving school districts, HSSDs as we've coined them. We want to be able to encourage, support, and promote the idea that these two systems that traditionally have different laws, different structures, different leadership, different funding streams, and rarely talk to each other, now we'll actually have dedicated funding to promote the transfer, the guidance, the path of all those students that I was indicating. I will be more uh, specific about that. This is what HSSDs look like in terms of their numbers. 53% of all Hispanics in the public K-12 system go to a Hispanic serving school district. And you can see the numbers for the other uh, races and ethnicities. 75% of all minority kids in the public K-12 system in this country today, I'm sorry, 2015, this is the data available to us in the NCES database at the moment. 75%, three out of four of those minority kids are already in one of these school districts. This is a map of the emerging Hispanic serving school districts. These are school districts that are somewhere between 15 and 24.9% Hispanic enrollment. This is a map of the Hispanic serving school districts and where they're located. There's in fact a map that you can find on our website. This, we call this a heat map. So you can in fact play around with this map and look at the data that it provides you. I wanted to take the opportunity to show you a few of the states that you can see on the map and the information that you can derive from it. So picking Kansas, blue circles are HSIs, green circles are emerging HSIs. The yellow dots are Hispanic serving school districts. The pink dots are emerging Hispanic serving school districts. You can see the numbers of what Kansas looks like. This is what North Carolina looks like. It's not surprising why there are X, six emerging HSIs in North Carolina. Look at the school system, the public K-12 K school system, feeding those institutions. They are on the verge of becoming HSIs. 
And those school districts in other parts of the state are gonna fuel the creation of the next set of emerging HSIs. This is what Colorado looks like. And my personal favorite, this is what Idaho looks like. <laughs> what I like to say on the Hill, and I do say it with all the respect in the world, if Idaho looks this way, it's not hard to understand what's happening in the rest of the country. And that's what that looks like. This is a 47 state matter. There's over 5,000 points on that map between HSIs, emerging HSIs, Hispanic serving school districts, and emerging Hispanic serving school districts. Over 5,000 dots. This represents over 17 million lives of just Hispanic students. When we add the rest of other minority students at the same institutions, we start to get a picture of how vital this feeder system, this structure is, and how it needs to be better supported and better coordinated so that we don't continue to lose 10% of all our high school students who don't graduate from high school. I'm talking about Hispanics. Hispanics are in fact out enrolling Caucasians in higher ed today if we look at the population of 18 to 24 year olds. But we have the highest drop college dropout rate because they're not ready to succeed in higher ed. We wanna create this new gr grant program so they have a better path. This is a 47 state matter the three states not represented on this map, Maine, Vermont, and since my mother's from West Virginia, I can say West Virginia, officially the three whitest states in the country. Why does any of this matter? These next two slides indicate a series of bullet points that bring home the priority that this is for Haku. HACU is the only national organization solely dedicated to the topic of Hispanic access, success, and retention in higher education. And now we have a component. We actually have an office in our headquarters in San Antonio dedicated solely to the issues of K-12 education because our board understands that's where our future students come from. We need to do a better job of associating ourselves, coordinating with them, working with them, to support those students before they show up at our doors. We wanna put money behind that. <laughs> we are aware that one of the biggest challenges we face as a nation is the shortage of Hispanic teachers. We are 26% of the entire public K-12 system, but only 8.8% .8 of the teachers are Hispanic. I grew up in Puerto Rico. I was born and raised there. So I'm familiar with Hispanic teachers, but I know that's not the reality on the mainland. You can go through the entire system as a Hispanic kid and not see more than maybe one of your teachers being Hispanic. No other race or ethnic group faces such a disparity between the makeup of its student, of its student body and the makeup of its teaching core. We want to address that. At the moment, out of the 492 HSIs, 170 four-year HSIs have schools of education. 123 of the emerging HSIs have four-year schools of education. When we look at the list of two-year schools, where so many of you, so many of your colleagues go for uh, going training certificate work, there's, a, I believe it's 185 of the two-year HSIs, community colleges, have those programs. We are a great resource. Not only that, we produce the majority of Hispanic students. So there's a lot of work that HACU is already doing around teacher prep, and we want to make sure that Title II of HEA survives. Because the current chairman of the Senate Health, Education, and Labor and Pensions Committee wants to eliminate Title II of HEA because he thinks that should only be a state rights issue. We disagree. We respectfully disagree, and we are part of the force pushing back on that idea. 
89% of all Hispanics in K-12 go to an HSSD or an emerging HSSD. This is vital for us. This is, we know where these students are located. We know where these institutions are. The growth of, his, uh, of HSIs over the years has been on average 12 institutions per year. And about 2010, that jumped to about 30 HSIs per year. The slope is in fact getting taller, higher, because more of your students are in fact graduating from high school and seeing the promise of higher education be a reality for them. So I personally thank you and your colleagues for that. I have two sons. The first one graduated from college uh, this past June, and I have another one who's a sophomore, and I know they are where they are because of their teachers. So I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> we are the backbone of our economy going forward. And we know that these institutions exist and we know the makeup of them. We want to support them. We want, for, we want to insert a new Part C in the next reauthorization of the Higher Ed Education Act. Our institutions are gonna put, push for this. We hope that NEA joins us in this push. I like to tell our members who are not very savvy of the ways of Washington that this adage, I've been doing this for more than 20 years, this adage is so true. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu, you're being carved out. And I put this image It depends on your point of view. <laughs> right now, we're the pancake. We are the pancakes, folks. I want us to grab the fork and the knife and carve them up. Right now, the Department of Education has proposed the restructuring, which might be a euphemism for something else, of the Office of English, English Language Acquisition. That is a very grave concern to Haku and our supporters. So we worked with other co-conspirators, as I refer to them, to insert language into the Labor, Health and Human Services Education Funding Bill that actually was signed into law yesterday that includes that last few sentences prohibiting the department from doing what they were hoping to do with that office. It might be a small office, but it's not small to us, and it's not small to the people who are trying to learn our language so that they can become bigger contributors to our future. So we were very happy to insert this language, and we will need your help to make sure that that continues to be the case. This is the URL of the website where all the data that I just shared with you can be found. I hope that you visit it. That map, that heat map, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can look at any of the data points, you can click on it, and it will give you the name of the school, every single one of those 5,000 points. Give you the name of the school, where they're located, the number of Hispanic students, the proportion of Hispanic students in that institution. You can look at it by state, by congressional district, hakuadvocates.net. If you want to keep track of what we're doing with Part C and Hispanic Serving School Districts, you can sign up at this website and you will receive all of our information that we put out about the work that we're doing on behalf of HSIs and Hispanic students, and particularly around HSSDs and Part C. We're hoping to have a bill dropped at the end of this year, just obviously as a marker, so we can begin to educate the congressional offices about this. This is brand new, this is, these are new ideas. This is language that we are inventing because we see the priority, we see the necessity for it, and we also know the impact that it will have if we succeed when we succeed. And I would be remiss, since I am a member of my association, that uh, I would not share, that I have to share with you uh, the next three events that HAKU has. 
uh, as I said, we're in Atlanta next week for our um, annual conference, and we'll be in Chicago next year. We hope to partner uh, more deliberately with the NEA in the work that we're doing in Chicago and going further. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure to be here. I hope you found this information useful and informative. Luis shared something with me that, that uh, touched my heart, too. He said that he, he credits um, uh, educators for the success of his kids who are going to some tiny little, you know, podunk university with a Stanford or something <laughs> like that. But, but um, what did one of them do? So I, I was sharing with Lily that um, my oldest graduated from high school, as I said, this past June. Uh, the summer after his sophomore year, he got an internship at SpaceX. And last year, at the summer of his junior year, they offered him a job, and he graduated this June. He's going to finish his master's and then go work for them. But I was so proud of him. That Christmas, after that first internship, he came home. He had bought a bunch of swag for SpaceX. He went back to his school went to his math teacher and said, thank you. That school got him into Stanford. She got him into SpaceX, and he wanted to say thank you. And I'm so proud of him. Thank you for what you do.